Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Lord's Day Worship at All Saints Presbyterian Church. And happy Father's Day to all of you who are fathers. Uh, what a blessing that is for each of us. If you would please give attention to the back of your order of worship. And if you need one, our ushers are standing by. Kindly raise your hand and uh, we'll get one to you straight away. Once again, a blessed and full day of worship. We have the Stalson family joining us in membership today and also the baptism of three precious children, Leaf and Otto and Arrow. So uh, in just a few moments, we'll be blessed to witness that. This coming week, Wednesday Bible study continues in the fellowship hall. There's some details for you there to pay attention to. Next week, just so you're aware, and it's our custom every month to give a prayer and blessing of the children. Last Sunday of the month, that will take place next week before we close worship. And forum will resume next week. We're having a, uh, a time of fellowship to recognize the new memberships and baptisms of the Stalson family today. So please join us for that in the fellowship hall uh, immediately following worship if you are able. And that's all I have. How about announcements from you this morning? Mr. Newell, Garrett Newell. Oh, wonderful. Hey, Garrett, happy Father's Day for the first time. Uh, any other announcements? Mr. Hessler. Congratulations, uh, Kyle and Jenny, as well. And for those of you in, in, down in the fellowship hall, uh, announcements that you may have just missed, the Newells are expecting, the Hesslers are expecting their second child. And also Sean Brandt shared with me that his daughter, Lydia Lippincott, is also expecting. So uh, what wonderful news on Father's Day. All right, who else? I was kidding, sort of. <laughs> all right, if that's all we have this morning, let's prepare our hearts to worship the one true God. Good morning, everybody. Morning. I'm happy to announce. No. <laughs> I'm happy to announce that today we have the privilege of welcoming the Stalson family, Gunnar and Caitlin, and their three children into membership. Please come and join me here at the front, and also of baptizing their three boys, Leaf, Otto, and Ero. So as they step up here, you've been getting to know these guys. I know many of you. Uh, we'll have known them before they showed up here. They've got some family members here. It's a bit of a Stalson takeover going on. But of course, that's highly to be welcomed. And at all saints, just for the benefit of those of you who are visiting us here, we, uh, we have a, a formal system of membership, which among other things, gives us all as a congregation, and new members in particular, a chance to reaffirm those basic and foundational commitments, which being a Christian means in day-to-day -day life. And that's what I'm going to invite Gunnar and Caitlin Stalson, and if they want to join in with the I wills and I do's, their boys, to participate in this morning. So it is with great joy that the elders announce to you that the Gunnar and Caitlin Stalson family have requested admission to all saints here in Fort Worth, Texas. We've met with them, and we present them to you as faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Now I get to ask you these questions by which you affirm your commitment to follow Christ as a part of this congregation. 
Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God? And do you trust our Lord Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Do you, do you believe the Holy Scriptures to be the authoritative word of God? And do you commit yourselves to growing in your understanding of the Holy Scriptures within this church, knowing that we hold to the historic teaching of the Protestant Reformation? Will you seek to live in such a manner as to bring honor to Christ and his church through the pursuit of holiness in all things and peace with all men? Will you diligently make use of the means that God has provided for growth in your Christian life, such as regular Bible reading and prayer, study, fellowship, church attendance, and the Lord's Supper? Will. Will you discover, improve, and make use of your God-given gifts for the service of others, especially those who are of the household of faith? Will you submit yourselves to the discipline of this church and its elders, as expressed in the church constitution, graciously receiving encouragement, instruction, and correction. Will you support this congregation by your prayers, attendance, tithing, and labor, and by the spreading of the gospel to those outside the faith? Otto just keeps saying we will to everything. It's like three or four times each question. Yeah, very willing. Good. Well, let's have this last one. Will you seek to establish and maintain a covenant Christian household in the way of our Christian faith? We will. As we all hear, indeed. Wonderful. <laughs> Members of all saints, I invite you to stand as I ask you formally to recommit yourselves to one another in this family. Having heard this covenant pledge declared before you this day, do you likewise pledge yourselves in covenant with the Stalson household, not only to fulfill these duties yourselves, but also to pray for and encourage them as fellow Christians and members of this congregation? Do you? We do. Wonderful. Now, I invite you to sit because we have some other business to take care of. In a moment, I'm going to baptize first leaf then Otto, and then Ero in the name of the Triune God. Just a word of introduction about what we're going to do shortly. The sacrament of baptism is administered by the church in accordance with the command of Christ to make disciples of all nations. These disciples are to be baptized, Jesus said, and taught all that he'd commanded, Matthew 28. Baptism represents and seals our union with Christ, Romans 6 the outpouring of the Spirit of God, John 1, and the resulting regeneration, adoption, and cleansing from sin, Titus 3. By baptism, we are formally welcomed into the visible covenant community of the people of God and made members of the church, the body of Christ. And so as you approach this, perhaps I'll pray for you, and then I have some questions for your parents. So shall we pray together? Merciful and gracious God, Thank you for these young children upon whom you have fixed your mind since before they were born and indeed in eternity where you dwell with everlasting light. We thank you for bringing them to this moment where we get to see your grace outpoured upon them. Strengthen and watch over them and so bind them to Christ that they may be faithful members of his body all the days of their life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so now some questions for mum and dad. You have been taught that baptism is a sacrament of God to seal unto us and our children his gracious covenant. Therefore, it must be used for that end and not out of mere custom or superstition. In order to make it clear that you understand the oath pertaining to this sacrament, I call upon you to make a public declaration by sincerely answering these questions. So first, do you acknowledge that your children... Though conceived in sin and subject to all kinds of misery, and indeed to condemnation itself, are sanctified in Christ, and therefore they ought to be baptized. Do you, by this sacrament, understand that you are obligating yourselves by oath before the Lord and his people to be faithful to this covenant? Do you acknowledge and embrace the responsibility of this covenant to command your household to keep the way of the Lord, 
to do justice and righteousness so that the Lord may bring to you the promises of this covenant. Do you understand that should you abandon these duties and responsibilities by forsaking this oath, that this baptism, rather than being a blessing, may become a curse instead? And finally, do you continue to promise in humble reliance on the grace of God that you will endeavor to set before your household a godly example that you'll pray with and for your children, that you'll teach them the doctrines and practices of our faith, and you'll strive by all the means God has provided to lead and raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Wonderful. Please now would you declare the Christian names of your three boys. Lee Henry, Otto Thomas, and Tara Davis. Wonderful. I think we'll take these one at a time, shall we? Lee, you ready? We're going to baptize you in the name of Jesus and God the Father and his Spirit. You're going to step over here. Okay, now I've got a towel for you here. So I'm just going to put, well, you can do what you like with it, but just don't put it on your head, okay? That's right. You can hold it for me. Good lad. Leif Henry Stalson, I baptize you in the name of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, Otto, are you ready? Yeah? I think you're big enough to stand. I think I'm not picking you up with one arm. You're going to come and stand over here. Your dad can come with you if you'd like to. That's fine. And maybe dad wants to hold this just in case it gets, uh, becomes useful. So I'm going to baptize you now in the name of Jesus and God the Father and his spirit. Arrow David Stolson, I baptize you in the name of God. Pardon me. I've given you the wrong towel. Otto. We'll just pause that for one moment and consider the theological implications <laughs> of what I didn't do. Otto Thomas Stalson. I baptize you in the name of God the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. try this. Come on then, Arrow David. You okay? There we are. Arrow David Stalson. I baptize you in the name of God the Father, <laughs> and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I've got some certificates for you which will help you to remember your names. <laughs> so here I leave. I've got this for you, my friend. Good lad. And Otto, here's one for you. Good lad. And there's one for Eero. You okay, Mum? Wonderful. Let's welcome these guys, shall we? I'm going to pray for you, if you don't mind. Let's pray together. May our Lord, who welcomed you at the font, keep you at his table, and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, descend upon you and dwell in your heart forever. Amen. Amen. These children are now received into the Church of Christ. Together we're the people of God, and we are to encourage one another to walk faithfully with Christ all the days of our lives, so as to come at last to his eternal kingdom. Jesus said, whoever receives one little child like this, receives me. So now I invite you to stand. You'll find within your order of worship a, a small sheet of paper with a charge, wherein we begin our exhortation to these young people to walk in the ways of Christ. Let's say this to these young boys together. Little children, for you, Jesus Christ has come. He has fought, he has suffered, for you he entered into the shadows of Gethsemane and the terror of Calvary. For you he uttered the cry, it is finished. For you he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And there for you he intercedes. For you, little children, even though you do not yet know it, 
This is one way the word of the gospel is made true for you and each of us. We love him because he first loved us. Before you go, Ben, I believe, has some gifts. I don't know who's going to carry these. You've all got your hands full. That's great. These are just some gifts which we've, it's our privilege to give to new member families, some books we've found a blessing to us. As you go back to your seats, the Lord bless you. Let's welcome them again, shall we? Now, as you remain standing, the Lord calls us to worship him. Let us worship God. We are gathered in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let us give thanks to the Lord. We give thanks to the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is the Savior of all gods. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. And as we do so, let us pray. Merciful Lord, we have assembled as your people this morning to declare your glory, to magnify your holy name. You are indeed to be feared, and you are worthy of our worship. Fill us with reverence concerning your greatness and your sovereignty over the nations. You alone are God. But on this day when we honor our earthly fathers, we draw near to you as our heavenly father. By the Holy Spirit, our spirits cry out, Abba, Father. Lord, we marvel at the fact that you would adopt us as your children, that you would make us your sons, and if sons, then also heirs in your kingdom. We are blessed truly to call you Father. So receive now the praises and the thanksgiving of your people for the salvation that you have rendered through your Son, which makes our inclusion in your people possible. And as you fill us with reverence, fill us also with gratitude for all that you have done for us in Christ Jesus. Father, even as we worship you, we confess that we also come to be blessed by you. We anticipate your cleansing from sin. We desire to be consecrated by your word. And we look forward to communing with you at the table, a table you've prepared for us. We've come with our service, but this is indeed your service to us as well. So thank you for the invitation to enter your rest. And thank you for hearing the prayers of your children. And so we, your children, now pray as our brother, the Lord Jesus, taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
be seated. Our corporate reading of the Lord's instruction this morning comes from Psalm 121. This is a psalm of ascent. Let us read it together as if we were headed to the house of the Lord. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From whence shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper, and the Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Is any one of you tempted this morning? It was indeed the Lord Jesus himself who taught us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So indeed by faith we prayed that this morning. And then also just now from Psalm 121, we read that the Lord will not allow your foot to slip. He will protect you from all evil. We've also confessed in song from Martin Luther's famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, that though our ancient foe does seek to work us woe, though his craft and power are great, that he's armed with cruel hate, we will not fear him. Why? Because we have the right man on our side, don't we? We face temptations every week. And yes, every week we fail. We fail in our strength. We fail in our strivings. But here we're graciously invited to confess our sins to the God who will deliver us from evil. And we're given the new opportunity to cling to Christ, who is our champion. You see, Jesus was truly tempted. He was tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he remained without sin. He resisted the devil, and the devil fled from him. But because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. May the knowledge that our God does not lead us into temptation. He is the one who delivers us from evil. And may our faith in the one who overcame temptation, may that readily lead us to confess our faith, our sins, to the Lord. If you're able, I want to invite you to kneel, and together let's take up this confession Let's begin together. Heavenly Father, grant us your mercy through Jesus, who is our own hope and Savior. Forgive us for our selfish disregard of one another. We confess that we have sought our own desires and not given preference to others in honor. Pardon us for our thoughts and desires which are evil. Grant us your forgiving grace for not zealously adhering to what is good. Forgive us for laziness in prayer, dullness in your ways, and failure to build up one another in love. By your Holy Spirit, prompt us to love and good deeds, and do not let our sins have dominion over us. In your kindness, hear and forgive as we now continue in prayer confessing our sins. Now let us continue in prayer. O oh Lord, an abundant pardon provided through your Son who is for us. And you have received us in him. Now grant, most merciful Lord, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. And this to the glory of God. Amen.
hear these words of assurance. If God is for us, who shall be against us? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. It's God who justifies. So who is he who condemns? Jesus Christ died. More than that, he's been raised to life and he is seated at the right hand of God and he is even now interceding for us, praying for us, perfecting us. So as Martin Luther once put it, when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, you tell him this, I admit, I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God. And where he is, there I shall be also. Because Jesus saves those who are tempted to the uttermost, I declare to you that your sins are forgiven. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our call to prayer this morning is a Father's Day exhortation to strength and to courage. And of course, it's applicable to mothers and sons and daughters as well. This is Joshua chapter 1, 
verses 5 to 10. God's holy word. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it, the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we have returned to this place, a holy gathering, for you have called us. Your law bids us here, and by your grace and in this modest way we have obeyed. Lord, bless our small obedience with great effect, that strength and courage and faith would be our resolve and reputation, as in the threefold Joshua exhortation just given. We return thanks today for faithful fathers, gifts of kindness and mercy you have given, the forefathers of our faith, godly examples through the ages on whose shoulders we stand, loving fathers near, and the faithful men who stepped in and loved us when fatherly love was absent or weak. Lord, bless the fathers here. May we be men who daily dwell upon how to be more like you, our Heavenly Father. May we inspire our children to zealous strength and courage, rooted in your grace and power, that they would resist trusting their own strength and bear courage against the evil wiles of the world. May we be filled with hope, joy, and contentment in faith that our children would see and be filled with confidence and boldness in service of the one true Abba, Father. May we be slow to anger, quick to praise, speaking only gospel verity and seasoned with the salt of love. May we be steady men of order and industry that our children would see through us that you, Father, are not erratic, inconsistent, or any wise slothful. May we administer discipline and justice with great mercy and forgiveness, even the faultless and forgiving mercy of Jesus. May we be men of wisdom and the word, daily growing and graciously attentive to the exhortations of our wives and slow to lean on our own understanding. May we be marked by service and sacrifice, reflecting the image of Christ and the church in our marriages and the likeness of the only and always true Father in our parenting. May the younger fathers of this flock rise above the elders, learning from our mistakes and failures. May we all see our children's children and perhaps some of our grandchildren's children. May we and our wives be blessed with long life, sharp mental action, and robust health in old age, bearing joy in Jesus that confounds the watching world. May we be found ready for heaven, leaving memories for which our children will lift thanks and praise. Selah. Even as we lift praise for Pastor Wilkins' health and very good news this past week concerning his cancer, illness concerns remain. Lord, remember Layla Hurt, Munir, Alaji, and those we quietly lift before you now.
May healing, strength, comfort, and peace be an abundant portion for these families. Dear Lord, be merciful and bless our expectant mothers as we give thanks and praise for healthy mothers and the sounds of the babies already given. Remember Amy, Henry, Abigail, Natalie, Rachel, Mary Ellen, Natalie Miller, Katrina, Amy Starnes, Leah, Lydia, Jenny, Victoria, Stephanie Treese, and the children of their wombs. Kindly grant to each joy, health, rest, and grace. We lift the church Catholic that you might continue in patience and mercy, growing and prospering her ministries. Father, please continue to raise up men to lead her faithfully, even here, and bolster the spirits and resolve of those already shepherding your sheep, especially our leaders and brothers, Pastors Neil, Jeffrey, Shaw, Elder Capone, and Deacons Robinson, Brant, Douglas, and Whittlesey. We pray for your encouragement, protection, and blessings to rest upon their service, their families, and faithfulness. Father, as we begin a new week, remind us of your fatherly love for us. Send help and comfort by the Holy Spirit and commission us today with a renewed and fearful faith in Christ. May we see beyond the temporal to the eternal, mortifying childish things, anxiousness and worry, strong and courageous, and all in the light of what you've already revealed about tomorrow in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Our lesson from the Old Testament comes from Exodus 40. This is verses 12 to 16. Again, give ear God's holy word. Bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance to the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then dress Aaron in the sacred garments, anoint him, and consecrate him so he may serve me as priest. Bring his sons and dress them in tunics. Anoint them just as you anointed their father so they may serve me as priests. Their anointing will be to a priesthood that will continue throughout their generations. Moses did everything just as the Lord commanded him. Our New Testament lesson comes from Philemon. This is verses 10 to 25. That I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and me. I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to have keep I would like to have keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but as a better than slave, as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me or owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading this morning is Luke 14, verses 1 through 6. I invite you to stand. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that's fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise Jesus Christ. The reading for today's sermon comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning at verse 6. Now, we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not warn him as an enemy, pardon me, do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Now may the God of peace himself give you all peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's pray, shall we? Merciful and gracious Father, how kind you've been to us in gathering us here to meet with you and now opening your most sacred lips in the words that we have before us in the scriptures. Open our ears, we pray, and our eyes so that we may see wonderful things in your law and shape us, we pray, in the image of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. And once again, let me uh, welcome particularly those of you who are visiting today. You're here for the first time. It is a real uh, joy for us to see so many new faces, and we hope you have a great time with us. And if you're able to stick around for the baptism reception to celebrate that with us, the new members reception, and, uh, and give us a chance to get to know you, that would be a real joy for us. In the last few years, a new phrase has entered the vocabulary of the American workplace. The phrase, quiet quitting. You may have heard it. 
It means something like to show up for work, to do the bare minimum required to keep your job and not get fired, but not do anything else. Somebody who's quiet quitting will display no concern for performance, they'll display no concern for excellence, for doing the best they can. Uh, they'll generally fail or refuse to engage in any meaningful way with clients or with co-workers beyond the merely perfunctory necessities of their job. They won't be concerned about any contribution to the bottom line or the productivity of the company. They basically occupy a desk, tick a few boxes, answer a few emails, draw a salary and go home. Now, in recent years, turns out this has been quite a growing phenomenon. I looked up the results of a Gallup survey, Gallup, the polling company. This blew me away, the results that they discovered. They surveyed 122,416 employees from 160-something countries. So it's a massive survey. I expected to find you know, maybe 5 or 10% of the respondents to that survey quiet quitting. The results of that Gallup poll found that worldwide, get this, 59%, 59 that's 5-9% of workers are somewhere on that quiet quitting spectrum. I suspect that Gallup, being Gallup, is slightly granular about it. There are probably scales of disengagement. But more than half, 59%, are somewhere on that spectrum of, yeah, whatever. In America, the figure is a little bit lower. It's just over 50%. Just think about that for a second. 50%, 50-something percent of the American workforce is disengaged to some degree along that spectrum of, yeah, can't be bothered, whatever. The figures, I mean, the, the, the cost to the economy so Gallup, I mean, they, all these kind of statistical geniuses they got working for them, they worked out how much it costs the world economy to have people working like this. Apparently, it's about $9 trillion a year. That is half the GDP of China. It's more than the combined GDP of Japan and Germany, the third and fourth largest economies in the world. If all the quiet quitters went back to work, right? Think about this for a second. All the, all the quiet quitters started doing a day's work, and you added up the additional productivity that they produced, and you put them all in one country, it would be the third biggest economy on the planet. That is how big a deal this is. Absolutely staggering. Now, the defenders of the movement, who are all over TikTok, which apparently is some website or app or something, and Twitter and Instagram and so on and so forth, the defenders of the movement argue that finally what we're seeing is justice at work in both senses of the word, justice at work. Finally, employees are pushing back. They're putting their foot down. They're saying no to the excessive demands of bosses who expect something for nothing and so on. And look, I'm, I'm ready to concede, okay? I'm, I'm very ready to concede that there are a small minority of people who are working for bosses who are incompetent and negative, neg negligent and exploitative and and they kind of have to carry on working because the normal kind of free market options to go find a job elsewhere are not really open to them. So I'm, I'm, I'm ready to admit that there's some of that going on. But frankly, here in the US, seriously? I mean, like in the developing world, where it's work in these quiet, exhausting conditions for 70 hours a week or, that, or you go back to a very rural existence earning even less, yes, I'm, I'm ready to believe that workers are genuinely potentially taken for granted by employers who treat them badly. Even in places like Spain, so Spain has about 13% unemployment at the moment. They've got about 100 and something thousand unfilled vacancies and 3 million unemployed people. So there's far, like 20 something times more workers than there are jobs for them, uh, unemployed workers rather, than there are jobs for them. But here in the US, like we've got 10 million unfilled vacancies and 5 million people unemployed. Like, now, obviously, not all of them could do all of those jobs, but it's, we're not in a position where employers are really in a position to really be exploitative to their staff. The, ch the challenge for employers, as any of you know who actually employ people, is to retain staff, correct? And so it's very difficult to find any justification for quiet quitting here in America. And so what we've got is 50% of the workforce doing less than or as little as possible because they can't be bothered, because they just want to kick back. And you see, on the, I, I admit, okay, I went on TikTok, sorry. 
I, I didn't download the app, I went on the website. And I, I, there's this one, I think it's kind of 70 gazillion million views to this video. This lady who's with her latte at work in the call center. Have you seen that one? I hope not. Good, well done. But she's just kind of mocking this culture of idleness, which is what Paul the Apostle would have called it. Paul the Apostle has a word for quiet quitting. Verse 6, idleness. And he has a fairly blunt prescription for it. Look at verse 6. We command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that he's received from us. He's clearly serious about it. This whole section is about this. Look at verse 10. We're going to come back to this. But even when we are with you, right, the first time when we dropped in on our missionary journey, unexpected, the man from Macedonia called us. Yeah, you would please come over here and help us. This is the help that some of you got. If you're not going to work, don't eat. Or rather, if he's not going to work, don't feed him. Verse 10. This whole section, uh, Calvin remarks on it, that Cal uh, um, Paul is speaking of, quote, idle drones, those who live by the sweat of others while they themselves do nothing. Now, I've been thinking about this, obviously I've had a couple of weeks off from preaching because I passed a show on uh, Jonah chapter 1, and normally when I'm kind of making notes on some material in advance, I've got you know, this kind of mind mapping software that I use, and if I get my mouse wheel and zoom out so that I can just about read it and scroll two or three times, I get to the bottom of the notes. Right, this time I've been getting repetitive strain injury in my right index finger as I've been scrolling down and down and down. Just seeing the extent of the implications of this passage, not because I think everyone here is quite quitting. I, I mean, maybe some need a, uh, something of a firm exhortation from Paul the Apostle, but behind this, the, so to speak, theological and pastoral structure of which this is the tip of the iceberg, has massive implications for the modern world. I actually think it has huge implications for modern mission. I think we have, we have the potential at, to distinguish ourselves as a people simply by working hard in a culture where 50% of the workforce is not doing so. Besides that, there's a whole bunch of cultural things we should probably think about, theological issues, and all the practical implications for different people, men and women, old and young, young people at school, retirement. We probably ought to think about retirement. Is retirement this kind of divinely and culturally sanctioned, kick back, relax, play golf, and drink daiquiris? Or should we think of retirement somewhat differently? Caring for the poor. I mean, it's, it's interesting that as soon as we start thinking about the issue of uh, to whom we give food or financial support when they've not worked for it, we immediately get to the issue of the gentleman who I drove past on the way to church this morning, about 10 to 10, who's standing by the intersection of I-30 and Hulan, and got a little cardboard sign in his hand. What do we do? You know, we've got to think about young people, we've got to think about school and preparation for the workplace and education and training. So anyway, I, was, I, I talked to Pastor Shaw about this. I'm like, okay, are we going to squeeze all this into one sermon? And he's like, mm, this, will be a, this will be a bad idea, right? So we're, we're not in a rush. We'll take our time. It might be two weeks. It might even be three. Because I want to hear the voice of the Spirit in what I think is quite a significant aspect of our lives as Christians. You guys spend half your waking life or more working. And clearly, therefore, this is important. So today what I want to do is get started on the... Uh, the basic outlines of the exegesis. Um, we'll dig in a little bit and look at some of the details. We won't get to all the details. We'll come back to some of that next week, and then we'll start to see some of the implications for us, and we'll see what we get to. So, okay, let's just get started, work our way through this text. If you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to open them. I do encourage you to bring your Bibles to church, because then you can check and follow along with me. Verse 6, this central instruction, Paul says, Now we command you, brothers, that you keep away from any Sorry, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness. The, the term to walk in idleness indicates a habitual way of life. It's not somebody who's just having an afternoon off because they're tired or they've finished their work. This is somebody whose habit of life is to live in idleness and not according with the tradition that he's, you've heard from us. The tradition picks up from uh, 2.15. It's both what was said in the previous letter and also what was spoken and probably what was lived out later, later on. Paul makes reference to that. Um, you've heard from us multiple times. We were with you, even if only for a few weeks, you saw us work. Now, keep away from anybody who doesn't do that, verse 6. Verse 7, 
Uh, he talks about this example that he and his colleagues set. For you yourselves know how we, you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you. He appeals to his own example. We know from Acts uh, 18.3 that Paul was a tent maker by trade and it seems to have been his habit in many places where he went to carry on his trade. He did it in Corinth. He mentions it there. He mentions it in, uh, he did it in Ephesus. He mentions that in Acts chapter 20. So Paul was in a position where he could legitimately have drawn a stipend or received remuneration for working. We'll come back to that maybe later on as well. But his standard practice was not to, for different reasons. And here it's because, well, we can see there's a problem in Thessalonica. Verse 8. We didn't eat anyone's bread without paying for it. Imagine that. Pastor, church planting pastor comes around for dinner. Oh, we'd love, we've got a pastor around. Isn't it lovely? And he, and he insists on paying. He's trying to send a message, isn't he? At some level, he's trying to send a message. And what that message is, we're discovering. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden for you. So, preaching the gospel by day, working, making tents at night, sleeping a couple of hours, if you can. And it wasn't because we don't have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. It's fascinating how Paul always seeks to embody the gospel in himself. And this is something else we're going to come back to. If Christ is a worker, and Paul, what is the hope of glory according to Paul? He says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. So it is to, to have Christ the worker in us. So we're giving ourselves as an example, he says, for even when we were with you, we told you this, like this shouldn't be news to you. We said if anyone's not willing to work, notice not, not able to work, but not willing to do so. Some important distinctions that we'll have to get to. We gave you this command, if he's not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear, so what's, he's heard that the previous visit, the previous letter and the exhortation that went with that have not done the job. Still there's, people are slacking. We've heard that some among you walk in idleness, See, walk in idleness, habitually idle. Not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now, this is something else we're going to come to. There's a hint here about what the, what the motive is for the idleness. It's actually connected to the eschatological teaching that the Thessalonians have got wrong earlier in the letter. So, rather than busy at work, they're busy bodies. Great wordplay in both Greek and English. There's a sense of, rather than doing your job, you're, you're getting about some other kind of business that you shouldn't be involved in. So, we'll come to that as well. Now, such persons... We command, again, and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly, earn their own living, and then finally restates the position. If anyone doesn't obey what we say, verse 14, have nothing to do with him. Don't regard him as an enemy, verse 15, but warn him as a brother, verse 15. All right, so that's a, a you can see a, the rough shape of the passage. It's quite forceful. In fact, that is the first thing that really stands out. We start looking at the details here. Just think about what we've just seen, and let's zoom in a bit closer. The first thing that really strikes you, isn't it how forceful and insistent Paul the Apostle is? Verse 6, we command you. That word is used um, by the, in Acts 23 to describe what the tribune, Claudius Lysanus, Lysanus, uh, said to a young man who'd come to him. It's a, it's a military instruction. It's used of what the Lord says in Acts 17. Uh, in the past, God overlooked your ignorance, but now he commands you to repent. It's not like yeah, it's a helpful lifestyle choice you might find fulfilling. It's absolutely laying it on the line. He says it three times in this section, verse 10, verse 12. He summons all his apostolic authority, verse 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to, and you're thinking, what grief is this? like 2 Timothy 4, preach the word. It's that kind of weight that he's putting behind it. But here, it's, it's keep away from idle people. His example is fascinating. Um, it's worth looking at this a bit more. In verse 7 to 9, he reminds him, look, when we were with you, like we set you an example. And this was really costly. And from one perspective, it was unnecessary for Paul. Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 9 that just as you shouldn't muzzle the ox while he's treading out the grain, and just as the old covenant Levites received their offerings from the worship of the people of God, so it's right for men who are engaged in the ministry of the gospel to receive their living from the gospel. That's the phrase he uses. And he insists to the Corinthians that he could have 
held on to that right, but he relinquishes it. Now, in Corinth, he relinquishes it probably because um, he doesn't want to present himself as one of those sort of paid public speakers who is dependent on the patronage of wealthy people in the city and so on. There was a real problem with that in Corinth. But here, it's actually a different motivation. It's here, but you, here it's like, there's too many people in the congregation or too many people to whom I'm witnessing who have no idea how to work and somebody's got to show them. And the last thing they need is to have as their role model somebody who comes and then we give him stuff, give him money, give him food. We, I, it's gonna, oh, so what are we going to do, brother? So, okay, well, okay, I'm... I'm I'm not going to receive a wage until you lot stop, start working. More or less what Paul's saying. Now, don't worry, I'm not saying that. Well, but the, the, yeah, you, you see what Paul is saying. It's like this is really significant. And then it's interesting, um, verse 12, there's a very subtle change of phrasing here from verse 6. Um, the, whole, the whole section actually, verse 6 down to verse um, 12, is uh, chiasm. You knew that, right? Um, just look closely. I'm not, don't do it now. I'm not going to show you now. But in verse 6, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 12, we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we were talking about this on Friday, Pastor Shaw and I. And Pastor Shaw highlighted it's just a fascinating phrase because it's exactly the phrase in Christ that Paul uses elsewhere not to denote authority by which he commands in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, but to connote what it is to be a Christian. To be in Christ is precisely to be one who is indwelled by the Spirit and united to Jesus. To, to say something in Christ is to say something by virtue of which we are one with God our Father through the Spirit because we're united to Jesus. In Christ means it's constitutive of Christian identity. And now he commands you in Christ. In Christ. To do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Because obviously, do your work quietly and earn your own living is just what people in Christ do. Being in Christ necessarily entails work, and earn your own living. And uh, so we're chewing over this, and Pastor Shaw points out, well, look, it's obvious, isn't it? I'm like, is it? <laughs> um, we've got allusions earlier, which I'll come to in a minute, to the, the Genesis creation narrative, where, well, firstly, God is a worker, but then secondly, Adam is supposed to be a worker and fails in his work. And Jesus is the last Adam, Adam failed in his work, which is it's actually picked up in verse 10, the, the work and eat. The eat, eat by your work is Genesis 3.19. By the sweat of your face, you'll eat bread. Remember? We'll come to that in a second. But the point is that the parallel goes deeper. The parallel goes to the point where um, Adam failed in his work. He was there to guard and keep the garden, and he failed to do so. I mean, he failed to guard that tree from his wife. He was silent, and therefore complicit in her sin, which is why it's the sin of Adam, not the sin of Eve, which is held up as the, the archetypal sin. Adam was lazy. In Genesis 3, it says, she gave some to her husband who was with her, and we discover to our horror that the whole time that Eve is talking to the serpent. Adam's just like standing there gazing at the leaves or something, doing nothing. Adam's sin was precisely that he was not working, idly standing by. And Christ is the one who overturns Adam's sin precisely by his work. Think how he labored. Think how he, you know, many nights he would stay up all night to pray. And then he's like, we must go and preach to the other villages also. And, and Mark, in his gospel, keeps highlighting how Jesus does this. And then immediately he goes off and does something else. And immediately he goes off and does something else. You get this sense of this um, greater Jehu. Remember the king who everyone, everyone could tell that Jehu's coming because it, the, the guy driving the chariot is Jehu because he's driving like a madman. Because he's in such a rush to get done. All the, 
precious and important things that need to be done. Jesus is the greater Jehu, the one consumed with zeal for my house. Zeal for your house will consume me. That's what the disciples remembered when Jesus flipped over all the tables in the temple. And just think, let, let, that, let those words sink in. Zeal for my house. What, the temple of the Lord? Well, yes, obviously. Yes, but in Greek and Hebrew, just as in English, the word house is the double meaning of household. Jesus has zeal for his house, the temple, because he's passionately concerned for his household, his brothers and sisters. Jesus is a worker. He redeems work by working. And now, now you want to be united with Christ by faith. Here we sit, united with the greater Adam, who is the worker. And what are you going to do? Walk in idleness? Je Jesus isn't walking the road of idleness. You can't walk with Christ and be idle. It's just, he's not going that way. If you're going to be one with Christ, you're going to be zealous for doing the work, which is actually the work that God has given us to do. Most shockingly, and again, back to the indications of the significance of this forceful instruction, you have verse 10. Now, we just run headlong into this, don't we? Look. Even when we are with you, we will give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. There is a consistent insistence multiple times in this passage, that if there's somebody in the congregation who's not willing to work, who could and should be working, you'd have nothing to do with him or her and not provide even the basic necessities for daily life. I don't know whether this is the most disobeyed instruction in the last few generations of the church in the West. It might be. I guess it might be. Now, just, just gather all that stuff together for a second. Just think of all the, the ways in which Paul highlights the importance of this issue. This is, it's up with anything in Galatians and 1 Corinthians, isn't it? In terms of the seriousness of this matter. And it actually forces us to think, if we're looking at verse 10, what would we do? If we can figure out what this means, would we actually do it? We gave you this command. If a guy's not willing to work... <coughs> And not, notice, not able to work, or not working productively in some other context that isn't remunerative. But if there's somebody who's just not willing to work, somebody who's idle, well, have nothing to do with him, don't give him anything to eat. Now, what, what, what would it mean? What would we have to do? There, there are a couple of understandings of this in the commentaries and other literature. Some have argued that it refers to formal excommunication that somebody who is unwilling to work, who's idle, ought to be basically just excommunicated. Now, it's easy to see why, isn't it? Um, excommunication, remember, is the culmination of a formal, lengthy process of church discipline. Somebody who's been encouraged and taught and then warned privately and perhaps warned publicly multiple times and has insistently refused to repent of a, a significant sin which has been drawn to their attention again and again. Eventually, what we reluctantly have to conclude is that they're not repentant. They're not f they don't have true faith in Christ because they don't have the repentance that goes with true faith. They've cut themselves off from Christ, and so excommunication is the formal sacramental uh, ratification of that. We excommunicate them from the Lord's table. So you can see why somebody might think that that's um, what's going on here because w with such a man, don't even eat. Don't let him eat. You know, you can see that and the logic seems to imply that, doesn't it? Moreover, there is a parallel with the, the text in 1 Corinthians 5, which is certainly about excommunication, uh, especially verse uh, 11. Let me just read from it, and I'll show you the parallels. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11. I'm writing to you not to associate, same phrase as in first Thess Second Thessalonians. That, fr that phrase, that verb, appears three times in the whole New Testament. Two of them are in 1 Corinthians 5, one is in 2 Thessalonians 3. Don't associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, another echo in 2, Corinthians, in 2 Thessalonians, but is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. And so uh, traditionally, and I think rightly, people have associated this with uh, a, a process of formal excommunication. And 
it just seems to have so many parallels, doesn't it, to what's going on in uh, 2 Thess 3. However, I think there's, okay, it's possible that excommunication might be at the end of the road for this person, but it seems to me more likely that something else is in view. Let me explain what I have in mind. Just look with me again. 2 Thessalonians 3. First thing you notice, this is different from 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 5. Because there's no process that is described. It doesn't say when you're assembled and the Spirit of the Lord is present, hand this man over to Satan and so on. It doesn't say that. And frankly, that will be useful for the Thessalonians. This is an earlier letter than 1 Corinthians. Uh, it wouldn't have been obvious to them how to actually excommunicate somebody without some kind of instruction on what we're doing here. It might not have been obvious. Uh, it would have been natural to expect Paul to describe that process. But then secondly, the result is expected to be different. In 1 Corinthians 5, it says explicitly, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Whereas here, it looks like um, you're wanting to remain in touch with him, not least because of the decisive feature at the end of um, verse 15, don't regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Can you see what I'm saying? So it's, it, it really becomes hard to see 2 Thessalonians 3 as a description of excommunication if the end result is you still think he's a brother. It's not like Matthew 18, is it, where it's like he's a Gentile or a tax collector to you now. So this looks like something else. Now, so what's going on? Okay. Like I said, I think it's all but certain that if this person or people like this didn't change, excommunication would be the end of the, the, end of the line, right? As it would be for any sin, actually, any unrepented of sin that somebody is, just ceases to struggle with and embraces as though it's okay. In the end, excommunication is always for contumacy, a persistent refusal to hear counsel and repent. But here I think something different is going on. You've got to think back into first century Thessalonica. Remember the church was small and really despised by most people in the local community. So the Christians would only really have had each other to depend upon. So what would have been the effect of Paul saying, verse 10, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. I suspect the effect is that that would have pretty soon jolted the recalcitrant idle offender back into action. I don't think anybody, if the only place you're going to get food from is the church, and the church says, right, no food from us from now on, I think you might be at the building site the next morning at dawn trying to get yourself a job so you've got some money. In other words, what Paul is anticipating here is not a process of excommunication, but a serious attention to the social relationships within the community that would have the actual effect of producing repentance. Notice verse 14. That he may be ashamed. It would be a good thing to have that cut the atmosphere with a knife kind of awkwardness whenever this guy walks into the room. Until he gets his act together, or hers, and starts working again. So that's what I think is going on. It's like, Paul isn't saying, hey, this guy needs to be excommunicated. He's saying, look, get a grip, will you? And will everybody else please get a grip? And pretty soon he'll realize he's got to change his ways if he's going hungry. That's what I think is going on. Now, let's just pause a second. Like I said, we're not going to try and cover all the practical implications of this, much less what's going on under the surface with like a Christian theology of work this week. But what you've got now is you've got a picture of what's going on in this text, mostly. The motivation stuff will come to next week. Let's just skip to some immediate and obvious practical applications. Can you see first on, first off, sorry, that we probably need to ratchet up somewhat the significance of this aspiration in our list of what's important in the Christian life. Illustration. Parents of children. This is the obvious place to go, isn't it? Parents, we have many, many desires for our kids. Look, look the, the, how many was it? Three people who announced they're expecting a baby this morning? And, and um, uh, two, two of you already have children, one couple for the, uh, expecting for the first time. It's wonderful news. What do you want for your new son and daughter? I mean, godliness, faithfulness to Christ, um, 
We pray that they will be free from like, serious illness and disease, don't we? We pray that they'd survive what are um, potentially difficult times in the early years before, early months before birth and then thereafter. And then we pray that they'd meet good people and pray they'd marry and have good friends and if they go to college they wouldn't get sucked into the ideological whirlpool and if they enter some other trade that they'd... they'd well, wh where do we pray that they would learn to be diligent, conscientious, faithful workers? I, I wonder whether almost the first thing that we ought to take seriously is not, okay, how do we enact this sanction, but how do we render it unnecessary by this being one of the prayers that we pray really regularly for our sons and daughters and for ourselves. I pray that our son, our daughter, would grow up to be a diligent, hardworking, cheerful man, woman of God. If we, if we just reshaped our priorities like that, surely that would be significant. Which, of course, then means it's quite hard to command and commend something we don't do, isn't it? Uh, next week, I think it will be next week, or maybe not next week, in two weeks, Pastor Shaw is preaching next week. I do want to speak at some length specifically to young people uh, who are not yet at adulthood. But let me say something now to parents and, and all of us who are adults. Um, Paul went to massive lengths simply to make sure that there was at least one, actually three, Silas and Timothy, examples of how to work in the Thessalonian church. Now, by God's grace, I, I think there are many examples here. Many examples of faithful men and women who know how to work, but Let's keep our foot on the gas, shall we? Let's, let's make it the case that one of the things that the young people here notice if and when they do go out into a secular workplace is, my goodness, this isn't what I was expecting. <laughs> my mum and dad never used to slack off like this and neither did all those other men and women at church. So let's make this a, what should we call it, cultural haven of Christ-likeness in relation to this particular virtue of being diligent in labor. Let me make some final comments just off the back of verse 10. I, I mentioned um, that we find here an echo of Genesis 3.19. I, mean, I just want to finish with a, just a couple of minutes on this. Keep this in your mind. This is Paul's command. If a man will not work, or if, if someone will not work, it actually doesn't say man, it, it, it's gen general, could be male or female. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Work and eating are correlated. Well, pretty much every commentator I've read recognizes here uh, an echo of Genesis 3.19, and rightly so. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. And of course, we, we normally read that as a curse, right? So it's like in Genesis 1.26-28, we've been given the command to work, to take dominion over the world, to fill it and subdue it and so on. Hard work, we've been given that instruction, and then you get to Genesis 3 and you discover, ah, oh, it's going to be painful, sweat of your face, you'll eat bread. For the woman, in pain, you'll bring forth children. And it's true, it is a curse in that sense, but it's also a command. I mean, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat your bread. What are we to say about that? Well, first up, it's clear that the instruction to work from Genesis 1 doesn't stop just because it gets difficult. It continues. That cultural mandate or creation mandate to work, to take dominion over the world, is still in force, obviously. But more than that, this command to work by the sweat of your face anticipates that it will be difficult, but also imports into the reality of difficult work all of the significance from Genesis 1. In other words, you could put it like this. What did God give Adam and Eve to do in Genesis 1? Well, it's basically to be involved in his project for the created universe. He rules over it, and we are to be his image bearers, and we're to rule over it, and we're to do so by working. And that continues now, even though you sweat, and it's exhausting as you do so. Now, you frame it in that context, you suddenly realize, oh, wow, this thing that we experience as sweat of your face is a gift. 
well, Genesis 1, the creation is a gift, isn't it? I, I wonder if one of the, the most helpful things we could do is to reframe our attitude even to the boss who is not particularly conscientious, the workplace which is not particularly pleasant, the work which is difficult, to reframe it as a, a gracious gift of God. I, illustration. Um, some of you children maybe remember the first time, adults probably as well, the first time your parents gave you a bicycle. Yeah? Or you got, bought a bicycle or something. And it's like, what a wonder. I can remember the first bike I had. Wonderful gift I was given. And it's extremely hard work. And I kept falling off it. And it's really painful. But it's a gift. You don't throw the bicycle away because it's hard work to learn to ride it, do you? I, I think sometimes we, we bifurcate between, oh, this is a command of the Lord, and this is a gift from God, when actually, isn't, is it not the case that all God's commands are his gifts? Just think about that for a second. Isn't it the case that everything God instructs us to do is for our good? A young man at one of the Bible and theology classes I teach um, a few months ago, he, I'll be honest, he's not at all saints, okay, so you don't know who he is, but I'll be honest, um, I've had to work harder than usual encouraging him to pull his finger out and do some work. One weekend, on the, he'd spent all of Saturday and Sunday afternoon working on some really hard physical labor. And I said to him, so, so how'd you find it? And he said, it was great. I thought, that's fantastic, because he's discovered that it's a gift. What a blessing to go to bed completely exhausted with all your muscles sort of burning and aching. It's a gift. And of course, that young man is learning to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. The sweat of your face, fascinating image. The word sweat, I've told some of you this before. The word sweat appears only three times in the Bible. Genesis 3, where it's the manifestation of work that is cursed. Uh, it's in Ezekiel 44, where the priest is not to wear in the sanctuary anything that causes him to sweat, because you don't bring cursed work in the sanctuary, right? There's holy work in the sanctuary. Of course, the, the other time, where sweat appears in the Bible is when it's sweat was like great drops of blood falling on the ground. Luke 22. In other words, Jesus himself took up the curse of the most painful work. It's by the, huh, echoing Genesis 3, by the sweat of his face, Jesus' face, we eat bread. Let's pray, shall we? Merciful Father, we thank you for the sweat of the face of Jesus. Thank you for the privilege of participating in that glorious gift that you've given us. And we pray that even now and today and in the days that follow and certainly in weeks to come when we shall have cause to reflect on some of the practical details we haven't touched on yet concerning this subject, teach us to embrace with Christ-like zeal and joy and conscientiousness, the privilege of working in the created world where you've placed us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. I invite you to sit, and together with gratitude to God, let's bring to him his tithes and our offerings. Let's give thanks. Our Father in heaven, great is your faithfulness. Moment by moment, season after season, you provide for, nurture, and adorn the bride of Christ. The giving of these tithes and offerings, when done with joy, is but an imitation of you. Even we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more do you, our Father, give what is good to those who ask? Cause these tithes and offerings, given in grateful praise, to bring true good to your people here and abroad. May your name be praised. Amen. Amen. As you remain standing, it seems right and good for us to confess our faith to the triune God as we come to this, the table that he has laid out for us. So I call your attention to an insert in your order of worship. We're going to sing together. Um, the Apostles' Creed.
Amen. Please be seated. Well, another week of work has been completed. I'm sure you've worked hard. You've worked hard because you've had to put bread on the table, right, so you can eat. Um, so we've been laboring all week, but here we come not to labor. We come to rest. And we come not to eat uh, the bread from our hands, even though this bread was baked by women in our congregation. We come to eat the bread of the Lord. For the bread of the Lord is true food, right? It's sustenance for our souls. Jesus said that his body was true flesh. He said that his blood was true drink. And so we come to be fed by him. This is a communal table. This is not our individual tables, but it's a table for all sinners and saints who are resting in the Lord Jesus. If you've been baptized, if you belong to the Lord, then we want to welcome you as individuals and as families to come and eat and taste and see that the Lord is good. We're always aware that every Sunday we have visitors among us. If you are a, a member of a church, if you would normally eat and drink at your church at home, we want to welcome you to eat at this table. This is the Lord's table. It's not the table of all saints. But we're also aware that it may be that some weeks we have someone among us who is investigating the claims of Christianity and has not yet come to faith. If that's you, we're very glad you're here, but we would ask that you would simply allow the, the bread and the wine to pass during this time, and we would welcome you to um, approach the Lord in prayer, for the Lord rewards those who earnestly seek him. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks, so let's do that now. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the work that Jesus has done for us. We don't come to this table resting in our own work or in our merit, but solely by your invitation resting in Christ. As we feed upon his flesh, we pray that our flesh would be strengthened to resist temptation in the week ahead and that our faith in your promises would also be strengthened and that Christ would evermore abide in us as we abide in him. We ask that you hear our prayer, for humbly offer it to the one who is interceding for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. After giving thanks, Jesus broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If those who are helping to pass the bread would come forward at this time, and you may hear as the bread is passed, the bread of the Lord. You may wish to reply, thanks be to God. The bread of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The bread of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The bread of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The bread of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The bread of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The bread of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
This is the body of Christ, the bread of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's eat together. When they were finished eating, Jesus took the cup and once again gave thanks. Let's do so together. Father, we thank you that Jesus drank this cup, the cup of your wrath. He drank it to the dregs so that we might now enjoy it as a cup of peace and communion, a cup that represents peace with you and fellowship with one another. If we abide in your Son, you are indeed our Father, and we are therefore your children, and we are also brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for this cup of blessing for which we now bless your name. We ask that you hear our prayers in the name of our Savior. Amen. Amen. Jesus then took the cup, gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant which is in my blood. It's been poured out for the forgiveness of many. Drink from it, all of you.
This is the cup of the new covenant. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's drink together. And now I invite you to stand. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith unto life eternal. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Receive this blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, your heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the saints of the, of the Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore. Amen.